Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, a show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. Uh, today, I'm joined by Vern Howard, CEO and founder of Halo, a diversity recruiting platform that helps connect college students across the country with leading companies such as Apple, Google, Airbnb, Airbnb Dyson, to name a few. Uh, welcome to the show, Vern. How are you? Hey, man. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. First and foremost, you win the prize for the best hat ever to come yeah, on yeah. the show. <laughs> such, a, such a good movie. I watched that. I told you before the, before the show. I watched that and I watched Billions last night. So I just keep flipping through all these movies now. This hat Love is it. sick. Love it. <laughs> Before we jump in, give everyone sort of the, the origin story. We'll go into more detail because I absolutely love your journey. It's super inspiring to me as well as an entrepreneur. Um, but tell everyone a little bit more about your background and your journey to where we are now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, graduated at 16. I'm, I'm from Rochester, New York. People in the States, everyone will say that that's not really New York. and That's fine. Whatever. Um, <laughs> so I graduated at 16. I was really gifted in math. I didn't know what I wanted to do after college. Uh, after like a year of like sitting around and I worked a job at UPS, which was really tough. Um, I listened to my mom and went to college, went to Virginia Commonwealth University, studied uh, computer science, well, computer information systems in, in a mathematics math, um, concentration. Got to the career fair, talked to Capital One and JP Morgan. I wanted to work in sales and trading. JP Morgan was interesting. I, I played lacrosse my whole life. Most of my friends who played uh, all went into IB. I guess it's like a thing. I, I checked out the culture at sales and trading. I, I didn't really like it. And then Capital One pitched me on the fact that they weren't competing with Morgan Stanley. They were more so in, in a race with Facebook to be a digital bank. And it was really interesting. This was 2012 and cryptocurrency wasn't a big thing. I instantly took the job at Capital One built out their first mobile banking application, the native one, which is the, the app that everyone uses today to do their checking and savings. Rotated over to being a hacker at Capital One, which I, I helped build out the white hat hacking team at Capital One. Got my CEH, which is a certified ethical hacker certification with uh, some guys from the NSA and CIA, which was great. And then I got kind of bored in that role and I wanted to move- oh, wait, I love the way you just glossed over all of those achievements. I know you've probably said it a million times, but, but yeah, for yeah. everyone else listening to me, it's like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, that was fun. It was super, it's fun. Um, I try not to harp on them too much. Everyone like, <laughs> me all the time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, relax, Ben. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that was fun. I, I tested in the one percentile. I can keep going. I, mean, I, I only missed one, one question on that, like CEH. I think it was like over a hundred questions. And I studied like, I crammed like two days before the test. I don't always do that with everything. Like I don't prep for things, <laughs> meetings or anything else. I, I just do better when I cram because I went through Toastmasters as a kid. My mom forced me. So really oh my god that's a whole yeah. other story <laughs> yeah so, so i used to never write my essays before i i literally write notes bullet points while she was dropping me off to go do my essay presentation at toastmasters each time every week i would just write notes wow. like, why are you taking why did you just not do this during the week and i would just it's just for me it's better to just do the cram and the bullets the bullet thing anyway yeah so the, that's a whole other story but i uh that's how i kind of handle all my meetings now i kind of feel it out but yeah, after the CEH, I got bored. I was like, I want to do something else. I started trading my bonus and like dibbling and dabbling around in trading. And uh, in the same company, right? So you, you mentioned they, to be lost. Like, capital One still. Yeah. And and <laughs> what happened was the guy who ran the trading floor was like, yo, I hear you're trading your bonus. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, do you want to come sit on the trading floor at Capital One in DC? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I do. And it was like a small trading floor at Capital One is maybe like 20 people in, in there. It's like, you got a triple badge to get all the way in the trading floor. And it was that, it was that locked down that no one even knew it existed. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy. Um, and yeah, I would help these traders book trades in this IT platform called Murex, which is a lot of configurations, which was, was awesome. But uh, during that time, I read a hundred books. One of them was Rework. I, I was going around the country because Capital One was like, who's this kid, Burn? He didn't go to an Ivy League. He comes from this non-traditional background, but he's running laps around all these other students that we're recruiting from like these Ivy League schools. How do we find more Burns? And what I noticed was they would send me around to colleges to talk to students. And that model was broken because we were only interacting with a small amount of students. And I was like, what if we build something that lets us interact with every student in the U.S. and position them, right? So if someone is similar to Vern, I can share with them what I did to get to where I'm at. And they can kind of try to follow my journey. On versus, scale. Yeah. And I was like, what, what if we use like technology to do that? And uh, no one thought it was possible at Capital One. I quit my job, liquidated my 401k, started building out Hollow and... Uh, caught the attention of Garrett Camp, the co-founder of Uber, and got to pitch him in June 2017 or July. Tell us how that happened, because that's a good, cool story. 
yeah. and again, I love the work the fact that you just glossed over the fact that you just quit your job and just started this company. You know, yeah, it's not- it, was like, <laughs> it was so hard. How I met Garrett was I'd read a hundred books in 2016, and why did you read a hundred books? What was that? What, what, what did you just read that somewhere and said, you know, if you need to be? Uh, <laughs> not, it was like it's funny. It was like a movie, you know, in like movies when like the character has like a coming, like a coming to God moment where they're just like, what am I doing? Like, how do I, and it's like right before they glow up, I use the word glow up, like right before they glow up. I was, I was literally in 2016, like, okay, I worked this amazing job. Like I got a great job, like, and I'm young. I'm like super young, right? I had like a super nice apartment. I'm really into cars. So I, I had, I rebuilt a car in college with my dad, Alfa Romero Milano. So I had that at 88. And then I bought a, another car. It was like, it just, I, I had everything I thought I wanted. But you wasn't happy. I was not. I happy. know a feeling, man. I know I was, a feeling. I, I was just like, what am I doing? Why am I not happy? I've got the dream job. I've got the car. Yeah. The house. I know I know how you feel. I know exactly how you feel. And, and I was like going through this stuff. Like everyone was just confused, right? Like my family, my friends are like, what are yeah. you like, dude, you're, you, and I was chill. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like super young. I mean, I'm like 24. I'm just, they're just like, yo, you got this nice house and like your car and you can go anywhere and you got money. I'm just like, yeah, but this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't, it, it didn't, I didn't feel it. Like I just, I, yep. I just, I don't know. So I was like sitting there and I was like something, I have to do something. And like something is here. I don't know what it is to do. And then when I even got to the trading floor, like I'm not saying it was bad. I just didn't, I wasn't happy there either. And I thought that's what I wanted to do originally anyway. And it was just like, okay, money's not going to make me happy. So I got to figure out something else that I want to do. And I just started reading books about starting companies. And what I noticed was, Oh, so when, is that what the books are about? So the hundred books, there's a theme there though. Is it, it was, all of them were about like starting companies and like So I'm just, sure you had like the lean startup in there. You had all of the lean startup. I had Mark <laughs> Cuban's book. I had like this other book on um on, on this guy. I gotta like look up his name. But yeah, I had like tons of books that I would just read and just, just sit here and be like, okay, maybe I need to start something. And what I noticed was like one, I'm a minority, two, I didn't grow up in like Rochester is not an affluent community by any means. So like where I grew up, I, I don't even know anyone who started a, a corporation, raised That's money. Same you know, as me. Same yeah. exactly as me. I was like, I grew up in a poor area. I was like, I don't know anyone. I didn't, I didn't even know anyone in the entire area that even owned a house. Yeah. Like every single, I live on a council estate. So everything was owned by the government. And we were there because, you know, we couldn't afford that. They owned us there. You know, my mm. mom and us four kids. So the idea of even buying a house was like yeah. so far away from 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 where I was, let let alone starting a company <laughs> so, yeah. of where it was. It was too. F- it, it, it's literally to the point where you're like, it might not be possible, right? It, it and it's not because you had to learn so much in between that no one talks about. I, I was talking to someone yesterday. And I'm like, yeah, even raising money that's like a coded language, right? Like that's a whole nother school. Starting a company is a whole nother school. How to talk to company like customers. It's just it's so it's something that we just weren't we didn't know. Supposed to. Yeah, you just don't, you're not exposed to it. And maybe there's transferable skills there for sure. Like we discussed that help you get a leg up once you figure it, uh, the uh, other coded language out for sure, like the hustle. But yeah, I, I didn't know. So I looked around, I'm like, okay, I have to read these books. I have no one in my network who's aligned here. So I started looking up, I was living in Washington, DC. I started looking up the top people in those areas that had started companies. So one was Steve Case, the founder of AOL, who, who's my investor now. And AOL was like one of the biggest things ever, right? The other one was Ted Leonsis, who he now owns most of the, you know, the teams there in D.C. Um, it was Rich Fairbank, the, the CEO of my company. I was working at Capital One. His mm-hmm. co-founder, Nigel Morris, who I, I introduced myself. Like I just wrote him cold and he invited me over to talk to him about what I was working on. So initially I was like, OK, I got to reach one of these guys. So I took one of those books, Rework, and I pitched my company in the cover and sent it to the Verizon Center, which is where the NBA team, the Wizards play. It's now called the Capital One Center, but that's where Ted Leonsis was. And he read, he read it and emailed me back. So once he emailed me back, it's kind of like I got into this little network of like Ted Leonsis, my legal team who introduced me to Human Radford. And when I met Human, he was like, all right, yo, come pitch. And they invited me to New York. And I don't even think I knew that everyone was gonna be there. I knew Human would be there. I didn't know Naveen was going to be there, founder of uh, Foursquare, which is, he's awesome too. And all these guys at Expo, super smart, super smart. And they're all in the same circle, friends. They're all, yeah. yeah, They're all, (laughs) they're all all were VC partners at this firm called Expo. So I walk into this room, I'll never forget. I walk into this room and I see this table of folks and I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) It's like, okay, yeah, this is Naveen. He started Foursquare. I'm like, 
Okay. Like a table of yeah. billionaires. Just yeah, and they're like, this is Vitor, and he was the first designer of Twitter. And it was like, awesome. But the fact that they were able to get all these people in this room, they're like, this is human. He started to add this. And I'm just, after a while, I'm like, okay. You know, I stop, and I'm like, okay, cool. And then out of nowhere, this guy walks in, like, late, and everyone's, like, looking at him, and he's on his phone, and I'm like, who's that? And they're like, oh, that's Garrett. He started Uber. All right, go ahead, pitch. And I'm just like, okay. You know. <laughs> Wait, before uh, we go any further, before we go any further, <laughs> it, you didn't just send one book out though, right? And I love your, you sent that book to loads of people, of people. Right? Yeah, I sent books to people. I sent an album to Ben Horowitz from A16Z, a Kanye album, College Dropout. Yeah, I would do like lots of little creative things. I would figure out what people liked. And then that's try why to I love it, dude. Like that's such a, that's like for everyone listening, people always ask me like, Chris, how do you get these influencers and these, you know, that may have millions of followers on your podcast? exactly how you approach them i'll i'll message them things i'll send them stuff in the post i'll i'll try all sorts of weird wonderful creative ideas things in, in ways that they haven't been approached before and that's what makes me stand out but what you don't see which is why i wanted to bring this back a second you didn't send, send one book and you got a reply <laughs> it, it is you know it, there's hundreds of people that didn't come back probably and in my case thousands of people that come back but that there's one or two that do say yes then you build momentum and then all of a sudden now you're sitting in front of this incredible group of leaders yeah. um so yeah. innovators so yeah and i and i think that's too like when uh it's so funny you we, when we gloss over stories and we say and we kind of it's like trauma we we ignore those parts where it's like this person didn't write back and you kind of felt that or someone told you no yeah. and you felt that and it's so easy to gloss over them but you're right like that's the part where i try to write some of these guys even ted i mean i tried to write these guys a lot before and they would read some of them just wouldn't respond they're busy and they're like who's this kid like they're getting somehow, approached by a million people on a daily basis yeah, as well right? I mean, it, it somehow it worked also like i think the first time i actually pitched expa and those guys to get funding they turned me down i didn't get funding from from garrett and those guys until the second time i pitched yeah, yeah and that's important for everyone listening because you're kind of glossing over it which is because yeah. i was yeah, the going to answer the full story but you have to fail multiple times before you before you get there and it's like i was very lucky that my entire career was in sales so i was already immune to that like getting 100 no's before a yes was fine that and i and and i I learned to separate my emotions from the deal or from the from the conversation because if you you know if you take if you get emotional about every no then you're not going to last pretty long in sales but in any business environment any transaction in terms of building relationships you've got to separate the two things um, yeah, because well, a lot of people that I, I'm going to use sales as an example to come in and get emotional about not getting a, a reply back or getting rejected, they don't last very long um, yeah. as well. So that's a super important skill that people need to develop. And, and everyone's like, oh, it's like a magic story. And it's just like, no, you literally sit there and like, what is the most creative way that I can, sh- I can grab your attention? That's <laughs> yeah. it. I just need to grab your attention so that you, if I send you an email or I try to talk to you or whatever, you're going to be like, oh, you're the guy or the gal who did yeah. whatever. Chocolates. Like, yeah, great. Association is, that's the yeah. relationship building. Uh, just, <laughs> yeah. All right. So you're in the room. You're sitting in front of these, these, um, is this the first time you pitched before? Yeah. These are the first time I pitched those guys in person. Did you know I mean, how to pitch? Did you kind of read online <laughs> what this means? Yeah, yeah, I read online. One of my uh, one of my mentors early on was the the founder of Career Career Builder, which was awesome. So he he gave me a ton of advice on pitching, and um, I had a great amount of in, in the advisors too before then. So I, I was good at pitching. It was like a thing. It was like emotional for me to just go through the story and had a kind of flow. So that wasn't a problem. But it was just like it was this is the biggest room I'd been in, and it was like for for. A, a good sum of money so i was just like okay no one can really mess this up besides me so yeah i, I kind of start off the pitch going through they're asking a certain amount of questions and i think one question that was really funny where they were like well like you want to make these in, in-person connections but like why can't we just connect connect with each other on linkedin and i was like well no one connects with people on linkedin that they don't know already in person and they were like that's not true i was like okay and then i I had my screen open. I was like, I added everyone in this room on LinkedIn before I walked into this meeting. None of you guys accepted me. I said, I'm pretty oh, sure. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you'll accept me after we get out of this. And that's true. People don't realize that, but and LinkedIn's <laughs> awesome. But it's just like, you really don't accept or add folks on LinkedIn until after you've met them at a meeting or a well, you've at least checked them out a little bit, right? And done a little yeah. bit of research. So you're there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like, okay, I, this is somebody I really want to connect with. And, and only then when both people kind of opt in, does it work out? 
but people didn't realize that. And I was like, I'm trying to do the exact opposite. I'm trying to let people go in cold and meet each other. But also, you're bringing us, and then we're going to get into a second of more details around Halo for everyone listening as well. But um, what you're doing is bringing specific groups together, right? Whereas LinkedIn yeah. is like just, you know, the Wild West in terms of just everyone and anyone. Whereas yep. you're looking for specific, two specific groups that you want to bring together, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So t- tell everyone more about the inspiration then. So you've, you've already explained a little bit around the inspiration behind Halo, but then how did that come to life? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is I, we saw, and myself and my co-founder, we both worked at Capital One, and the career fair kind of like going around talking to schools, it, it was broken because we, we had no strategy. And most companies have no strategy on how they earn what schools they go to. They just go after brands. So it's Stanford, Harvard, you know, but what you'll realize is as a company, depending on your brand and who you are, your table may not get filled up um, at a career fair at Stanford if Amazon's there or another company that they really want to work at. Right. So what we noticed was that it, it was just no strategy for companies. And on the student side, students were just lacking access if they didn't have enough money to get into the right school, whatever that may be. Um, so we we're like, what if we just make authentic connections online and say, hey, regardless of your race, gender or your university prestige, you can still talk to X top five tech company in the U S and they're going to give you a shot. And after everyone's learning in our environment, students are learning about the companies, but the companies are also learning about these different communities of students, whether that be women, whether that be a school in the Midwest, whether that be minorities, they're learning what they care about before they click apply. And as a company, that's what matters. If you learn what these communities care about, you'll be able to build authentic relationships with them and organically attract them to your company instead of like, pitching or selling or for for what we're seeing right now is like this diversity washing thing where you're checking a I was box about to say that because uh, I saw that you used that terminology and I was going to ask you what is your views on diversity wash, uh, washing what what yeah. can, you know what can companies do to avoid that explain what it is for everyone that doesn't know and explain what companies can do to, to avoid that yeah I think what what's happening is we're seeing <clears throat> we're seeing a ton of companies that are like you know you know top five brands or whatever they're trying to get ahead of the message to not look as if they are in a diverse organization. So they're hiring maybe one female um, or, or one person of color, right? Which is just like checking a box. And what's interesting is like, especially with the chief diversity officer role, they're hiring like a female who's a, 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 like a woman of color, point blank. Mm-hmm. But the retention there is crazy. Yeah. To see them join is to be a huge press release. And then two months later, they're leaving. And it's another huge press release because they joined another organization and then another one and another one. And it's insane to watch because what it's showing is that there's really no change. What's happening is those those folks are getting there in that role with a mission to say, I'm going to make an impact here. And they're not actually, they're not given the tools likely. Or they're, or they're going, they're going, they're going to a, a, into a culture which isn't inclusive. Exactly. So they leave just as fast as, yeah. as they come in. And I completely agree with you. I'm seeing that in every day, unfortunately that you, you know you can hire the diversity but if it's, you don't have a culture which is inclusive then they're going to leave just as fast yeah, exactly and then that and that's what's happening and, and we're we're just super interested in the fact that why don't we do because a lot of this is not authentic but also a lot of companies are making assumptions on communities that they don't have a direct connection or interaction touch point with we want to teach them right and not us putting our hands on it to teach them, but more so the students can teach the companies now and i think that's the space we're in where hey it's time for you guys to turn this environment and market around to start learning from your, your candidates. So yeah. You, you're way easier. So give it on over. How does the platform work? So you've got two right. sides, right? You've got the companies and then you've got the universities explain yep. how that works, the role of each and how right. companies use the platform. Cause I think it's super important, especially given this new world of work we're living in where we can't physically do them anyway anymore. <laughs> so having, and that's why I was so, so excited to speak to you because I said to you, right, when we first spoke, I was thinking about a platform like this only a few months ago. I was like, if someone's made something like this, it would be amazing. And then all of a sudden your team reached out and I was like, oh my God, it exists already. Mm-hmm. So tell everyone how it works. The time uh, so, better. <laughs> right, right, for sure. So there's two sides of the marketplace, of course, companies and students. And we allow any company, regardless of you know, who they are, where they're at in their, in their journey right now, to come to us. They tell us their goals for the year, whether that's recruiting at different schools, different target groups or like goals for diversity and inclusion and how to in, in, like increase their percentage there. Um, we let them host online events. Um, these events can be <clears throat> Q&A based, which is just text based, 
or they can host live video events and they can stream basically live video chat sessions with over 100,000 students concurrently. So all at the same time, these sessions are only an hour long, but after these sessions, we are able to collect data on these interaction touch points. So we can actually show a company, here's what Af African-American females who attend Stanford University care about before they click apply at your company. And we can actually also let the company run more deeper surveys on these students to understand what's like, what are the deal killers for them what do they need to say they want to work at a company? Where are they at right now? What more do they need from the brand? These kind of like really qualitative pieces of information that companies might not know, but also quantitative ones that they can actually have measure, measurement on. They love it. And at scale, you can imagine it's just like doing research. At one point, these companies could only talk to around 31 universities each year. Now on Hollow, they're able to talk to 1200 at the click of a button and go back about their day and they can and they have the data right because at the fair you don't have any yeah. data at all yeah. and you're, and you're spending millions <laughs> tens of millions of pounds putting going to these job fairs and you know paying to be there etc cetera, etc cetera, and you don't have any data on success or roi apart from exactly. obviously the people that you hire from it but even then you're missing so much rich data exactly and and that's the biggest thing for us as a it's funny. That's one thing I did learn. I learned so much from Capital One, but for us, like we're we're big data guys. Like when we first originally built this, and 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 that's huge. That's a huge opportunity to teach people. Like use data to tell the story versus like a new press release on your new head of diversity or whatever. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's what many companies are missing. Uh, like um, uh, one of the questions that a lot of the companies uh, the struggle with when I ask them is, you know, what what data are you measuring? In, in, in some of these areas we're talking about, and they're like, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, there's not, they're like, they, they don't know. They, they can't answer the question or not all yeah. of them, but many. Um, and if, if they do have the data, it's very, you know, very basic. It's, um, and it's all very basic. It's not really in real deep insights. But what's interesting too, is the way we built our, and it's a super techie, the way we built our RDB and our back end, and like, shout out to my co-founder, Phil Ballman, he, he, he like killed it. If a company's like, yeah, this is great data, but can we go even deeper? We can actually, within minutes, go even deeper into a data and give unique insights to different companies that they ask for. Mm -hmm. It's just so nimble on the back end that we collect so much that we can actually say, oh, yeah, we can just tweak that for you. And it'll come out on the UI for them how they want it, but we can actually tweak any of the data on the back end because mm -hmm. we just collect a ton. So what's so. the model? Do you, the universities can sign up for free? And, the, yep. and, and obviously, because you need them involved, obviously. Uh, so that's where you get your users, right? Yep, uh, yep. Is it, oh, do you, can users only sign up for, if they're part of a uni or can anyone just sign up? So anyone can sign up. Anyone can sign up that has an association with a school, whether they're in university now or they left university. Oh, okay. It's funny for me, I always laugh. I'm like, yeah, the difference between like an alumni and like a new hire or a new fresh grad or whatever you call them is like one day and that's graduation. We like target everyone in like the early career spaces, which is interesting. We, we've even seen some like high school students sign up though. I tried to sign up today before this show, but yeah. I didn't go to university right? But, or college. So I was like, when I got to that part of the sign up form, I was like, I can't continue because I have, there's nothing being to put in there. I'll tell them to make sure we flag it to say like, yeah, it didn't go to university. Cause I think that's, I, I think that's important. Cause if you're talking about diversity and inclusion, like I, I never went to school, but right. I'm one of the highest performers in any company I've worked in, not to be arrogant. Right. Um, and I do think that that's important to have that in there. Right. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. I think uh, it's funny. It, like, we have our my story before and I was like, I wasn't going to go to school either. And especially during COVID, I don't think that's going to be, the big thing anymore. You know that? I'm like really bullish on the fact that I don't think it's going to be a thing that, oh, this person didn't go to college. And I always mention this, like Google launched Google Genius. I think credentialing is going to be more like, what are your transferable skills? What have you done yeah. to your point? How, how have you performed in what you've done? And then have you taken these three to four certifications? Then they're all online, right? Just take them and we'll, we'll, we'll rank you from there. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So basically, so if you're a company, how does that work from a a pricing model if i'm a company i want to i want to host an online event what was yeah. it look like yeah, yeah so the so the biggest thing is like we charge companies per event we don't charge companies based on how many students sign up because i mean we've hosted an event with probably like top two apparel brand in the world and, and we had over 1300 students sign up so we just don't want to like ding people for it's gonna get out of control <laughs> yeah because yeah, yeah. it, it, it can just get really not productive and our ultimate goal is we're on the side of the students right 
So if we don't take a fee from a company because we want students to have this event, then that's just so be it. Um, so we're always on the side of the students. But yeah, so we, we charge companies based on how many events they want to host. And it's just bundles, right? So it's like, do you want to host 10 events? Do you want to host okay. 20, 30, 40, 50? And, 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 and from there, we have other little features and stuff that, that might interest you, which we, we kind of ups, upsell on that as well. Obviously, uh, you, 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 you know, managed to get companies like Apple, Google, Airbnb, Dyson on board, incredible companies. What's the, what's, what does the future look like? What's your, what's, your, what's your end goal, if there is an end goal? So for me right now, I'm like really interested in two things. What happens to credentialing? And, and that's why I kind of like nerded out when you mentioned that. I'm like really fascinated with what happens to credentialing. So I'm, in, I'm into music. We, we've talked about this before. So I'm like really into music. So like right now in the music space, everyone's going like independent. Right. Which there's small waves of people doing the independent thing. There's been a monopoly there. But I think what happens that breaks the system is like when one huge artist like Drake level or something goes like independent, then everyone's is going to break because then they're going to have to start cutting. But you can different- self-publish now. Right. You can jump. You, right. can, you could go on sp- like most people's money have made not by the records. There is no records. It's by the number of Spotify listens. Right. Okay. Exactly. And then you make your money through touring. So it's the same thing in business, right? The university right. equivalent is like, the university is like the record label, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, I love talking to you. Yeah, yeah, you get it. Exactly. So that, and, and, and what happens then? What happens then when like the number one comp side prodigy in whatever country says, I'm in, you know, I'm in high school right now and I'm not going to go to university. And if I do, I'm going to go to the community college down the street that breaks the system because he can get into or she can get into any school that she wants to, but she just chose to not do it and just publish code on GitHub or build out cool apps. Mm-hmm. The thing about that story is that company, that X, whatever top X brand, top top tech company, they're going to say, I still want her and I'll pay whatever to get her to come work for me. Yeah, we've seen that already. Yeah, exactly. And once that happens and it's more prevalent, like it's more like more people have that success story it breaks the traditional model outside of what's going on right now, which is, it's all tied to money. Like why were people paying for admissions to get into this school? Well, they were doing that because if you go to this school, you get a better access to a network and, a, and like information and your career, it's a crazy trajectory just because you went to this school. So of course your parents are gonna pay for you to get in there, right? But let's be honest, like 99% of my friends that went to university, very few, if not, I can name a couple, that actually went on to p- pursue that as a, in, as, in a, as a successful career. Right. Many of them are working jobs, not minimum wage, but not great. And they're barely paying off their lo- student loans. So when I uh, graduated high school at 16, I, I took a job at UPS. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was, I was smart. But I, I did, where I grew up, it wasn't like really the thing for everyone to go to college. So I, I didn't know what I wanted to do working at UPS. I ended up getting into like this argument with my boss because I was like trying to figure out another way. I was like loading trucks and he, whatever, he got pissed at how I was doing it. Right, just like small kind of like factory job thing. And I was just like, yeah, I was like, I'm not gonna work here. And he was like, yeah, well, you're never gonna do anything but work here for me. So, you know, get used to talking to you like that, which I was like, yeah, no. Yeah, so that like pissed me off. So I called my dad, he's like, yeah, I'm in, you know, he's living in Virginia. So I'm like, yo, I wanna come out there and go to school, get get out of this environment like of New York and go to Virginia, just like fresh start. He's like, all right, so we go down, I I check out some schools, um, some of the schools in the area, like UVA, Super Preppy, U of R, kind of like Hogwarts, it's like, like it's Virginia. So it's like a lot of conservative stuffy, which wasn't me coming from New York, right? Like at all. Um, So so then I finally settled on like VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, huge basketball school, but also like a a really big art and like branding kind of creative school. So I settled there, but, I get to the like, go apply. And they're like, well, you can't apply. Like your, your SAT scores are they're, they're ridiculous. I think I got like a 470 out of 500 on my SATs, like for math. And it, it, they were pretty high, right? And so she's like, but your, te- your, your grades from a high school, like, I don't know, like, you know. And I was just like, yeah, they're not that good, but my SATs are like ridiculous. And she's like, yeah, but I don't know. She's like, you know what? We'll figure this out. So I met this lady, my dad's friend, Miss Day, shout out to her. She's like, what we're going to do is fine. We'll let you matriculate into VCU. She's like, you want to study computer information systems, which is like computer science. She's like, but you need to prove that you can actually take these courses, right? She was like, because right now we don't know. So you got to matriculate in. So you can only take three classes a semester for two semesters. You got to pay out of pocket and you got to get a 4.0 GPA. So they put me in like three classes, literally. And I remember I had a dorm and I was paying out of pocket. Like all my other friends, when I met them, they were 
financial aid and all this stuff. And I was paying out of pocket because I wasn't really a full-time student. I was only taking three classes a semester and I had to take those to prove to VCU that, I, choice, basically. that I could keep up, right? So do, to do that, I was, a, so I was a janitor. So it was funny. I used to clean the school at night, like some of my classrooms, like one of my calculus classes, I would go clean that classroom with the, like the squeegee, the big machine thing. It was like ridiculous because I would leave and I would come back at night and have to clean the school like certain buildings, poli sci building too. Um, and then I also was an um, algebra teacher in, in math in this inner city school called uh, Elkhart Middle. So I taught math there. I think they shut the school down now because it was like, it's wild. But yeah, they, I used to teach math there. So like I had all these random jobs to, to kind of like pay the bills for, for me to get into school. And eventually they let me matriculate in because I had to get a 4.0 or I just wouldn't have been in school, so. I'm interested to know as well, like um, as, a, as a black founder in, you know, in your field, in your area, what challenges, if any, have you come across or what advice would you give to other black, male, female, of any, of any ethnic background, to be honest, isn't white, Caucasian, male, um, that, that what advice would you give to anyone? Because I'm sure it, it's not easy. We've made it sound, sound like it's very easy and plain sailing, but surely not, that's not the case. Yeah, no, Chris, we need a whole nother podcast for that one. I think uh, one of the biggest things is like, for, for sure, it's different. So I'm based in LA now. For three years, I was in San Francisco. Definitely a different environment, not super diverse. So you're interacting with a ton of, you know, VCs who are kind of like the money folks. They might not value your experiences the same way because they, they can't relate, right? So, you know, raising money is about pattern matching. And for me, or I never forget, this guy told me, he's like a friend, he's a VC. And he's like, dude, your story is like, it's like you don't know what box to put you in, right? Like you play lacrosse and then you did this and like you're super smart and you're good at math. And you're, it's uh, like, but what, and he's like, what box do I put you in? It's like, you're not the guy who like grew up like uh, somebody's talking about like, uh, like LeBron or like you didn't grow up like just like super destitute and you didn't grow up like on this other side. He's like, so what box do I put you in? Like, I don't, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. He's like, is that also, what you like, mean by pattern matching is in putting you in one of those boxes? You can say, oh, yeah. that is quite unusual that you're, that you have both those skill set that you're, you know, from it, you're, you can code, yeah. you know, you're exactly. like an ethical hacker. And then obviously, and on the other side, you know, lacrosse and yeah. you're, you're done. That's not normal. Yeah. So that's, so that's the, yeah. The, and that's, that's the biggest thing is like, he's like, yo, there's no, there's no box to put you in. And he's and then on top of that, it's just like, you know, like, then you meet you and you're like, wow, it's, 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 you know, I might show up to a VC meeting. Like I used to actually go to meetings and I have like, how do you go to meetings? Do you go to meetings where you are right now? I would cover my, no, 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 no never. <laughs> I, would, I would cover my, my like tattoos. It was like a big thing, right? I would cover like, I have a sleeve. So I would, right? Yeah. I would cover my tattoos up. I would definitely not wear a hat. Like it, it was like all these little prep things that I would have to do before these meetings. And after a while I would just be like, why am I doing this? Like I'm going to the meeting and I'm supposed to be coming as my authentic self, but it's like, am I putting on a costume? And is it actually doing me, is it doing me any justice? No, it wasn't. It, it, it was still would not do anything because someone's judging you as soon as you walk in the room or you know how you talk or I anything. And I, I think one thing I always used to say to kind of VCs that I was like friends with is like, you definitely have to look at distance travel. Like your story, it's like how hard did Chris work to get in this room versus this guy who's who knew someone and he just got kind of like shepherded into this sales mm. job, right? That and shows you how hard they're going to fight, right? Because they have that resilience. That exactly, exactly. That shows you how hard Chris is going to fight when it, when it's when the chips are down and when it's time to really get get it, you know. And I think a lot of VCs don't recognize that. And then like five, six years later, that underdog who everyone passed up on the VCs, like, oh, it was brilliant. I knew it's like, well, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Isn't that your job? Like, why don't you, why don't you know? I, I just think it's many like, of the VCs themselves haven't come from that background. So they can't relate. They can't relate. And, and that's what I'm saying. So they can't relate and they can't, they don't value your story the same as they would value the story that's more similar to them, which is, Hey, I graduated and, you know, I got into Stanford and I studied computer science and then, you know, I dropped like, out. Like, tick, 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 box, box, box. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. So, so my story is nothing like that. So they're just yeah. like, Oh, I have no idea who this guy is. I don't know where to put him. I don't know who he is. No past, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's super interesting. Organizations like, you know, for, to all of the HR practitioners listening, um, do you think that, that that's, that we're still operating that way within organizations still? For sure. For sure. Because 
right now, it, it, much like in the VC space, founders, it's funny, as a founder in the VC space, when you're raising money, you actually feel like the VCs control that environment. When in reality, as a founder, you control it, you just don't know. But since you want the money to, to build your dream and build it faster and quicker, you go into these meetings on a kind of, you put yourself on a lower level when in, in turn, you should be saying, I'm giving you the opportunity mm. to fund my thing. That's right? what I say to my sales team all the time. I love that. I'm like, instead of, like, I always use my hands like this if you can see me. I'm like, you're, you're pitching them from here. Yeah. You're pitching them from yeah. above. Like yeah. here, like, so when they always say to me, Chris, whenever you close these deals with these vendors, like our sponsors for our summits, they're like, you talk to like, I'll say, this is based on what you discussed. This is what I, I recommend that we do. So I'm like, telling, I'm, I'm, I'm advising these yeah. sponsors to give me their money and how I'm going to, right? and, and it's just because of the confidence I've built over the years. Whereas I noticed a lot of my sales, or well, most people, they pitch from below yep. and they're talking up to people. Right. Yep. So I completely get that. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's, it's natural that most people do that, especially maybe it's a big name or somebody that, and you know, it's like that. And I think in the, in the hiring space again, right. Folks go into the room and they're like, Oh, I just really, you know, you want it so bad. And it's like, uh, you, you gotta be okay with walking away from a deal, whatever that deal is. But uh, it's like folks want the job so bad. So they go in and they kind of like pitch, like you said, under and then, and the, the hiring manager or the HR is like, ah, no. Right. It's just, it's not going to work. And I think, yeah, you, in the job space now, the, the seekers, job seekers, they own the market. I still feel like they own the market because they're like, hey, and especially at the college level, it's like, hey, okay, I just graduated this degree. I'm a hustler. I'm super smart. But your values don't align with mine as, as, as your company's values don't align with mine. So I'm just going to go start my own thing. And we're seeing that. Like the younger generation, they don't care. They're scrappy. They're just like, okay, I won't work here if you guys don't support a certain movement or a certain, certain thing that I think is like good right for humanity they just won't work there it's quite a generational shift because i remember when i was younger that definitely wasn't the case and yeah, I, you just, I remember yeah. someone telling me over the over years the balance shifts back and forth between um you know uh, 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 the markets you know uh, but you i think right now you're right uh, we're in we're in that position where, where people are being a lot more picky about you know like does this company, like you said, their, do their values and their why, their purpose align with my own? If not, then it's kind of like a deal breaker exactly. um, um, as well, which is, but it's easy to say that, but when you're unemployed, it doesn't always feel that way. Right. So when you, you walk into a you room, gotta yourself out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I always say it to my friends that are looking for jobs, especially right now, many of them are unemployed given current events. And I'm trying to kind of say that to them, you need to go in with that same positioning that you're talking about as a position of, I am the A side and you know, this is what I can bring to the table as opposed to like, I really need a job because mm. no one's going to hire that. Uh, yep. well, they will, but you're going to have got less chance of succeeding in your, in your own business. Then what do you look for as a CEO from your employees? What's the kind of key value uh, or kind of attributes that you're looking for, for people? Right. I, I think the biggest thing for me is I want to work with people who do other things outside of tech. So what I noticed is like, I'm really big into like design and product and these other things. So I used to like one of our engineers previous used to do stand up comedy. Like I like to hear about everything else you do besides the job, right? Because you wouldn't, have, I wouldn't even be talking to you if I didn't think you could do the job. So like, tell me about your life and like what else you do. Um, so for you, I remember we were talking and you told me about your dancing career. I was like, this, that's, that's dope. Like that's, that's cool. And so anyone I hire, it's like, they'll come in and if they start pitching me about like the work they've done at this company or that company, I'm like, great, 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 great. Like, what else do you do? Right. Because I want to hear like your other. That's activity. on your CV. Like, I don't need you to tell me what's in front yeah. of you. Right? Like that, you're, that got you in the room. So let's not exactly. sit here and talk about that because I can read yeah. that on the sheet. <laughs> and you want to work with people you like. So it's like, what else do you do? Like, what do you like? Because, you know, there might be bad days where we can laugh and joke or like good days where we can still, you know, and I want to know who you are as a person versus like that. Also, I think if you've done something else creative, you apply a different set of lenses to the problem, right? Regardless of what you're I've actually your fault, right, as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's huge. So like for me, that hands down, my interviews with folks are only like, and people are always like, wow, they're super quick. They're like 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> Literally. Because you've already, because you, yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's like 15 to 20 minutes. And some people don't like it. They're just like, what? I thought like, I'm like, yeah, I don't need an hour with you, bro. Like I can just take 15 to 20 minutes and then I'll kind of get a good read What's on your go to question? I would say the biggest question for me is I, I'd ask somebody like what book they're reading. What was the most recent book you read? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I'd ask that because I want to see if you like read. If you what read. if they say? What if they give you my answer, which is I, I listen to audiobooks because <laughs> I don't read. Yeah, I would, and I would ask them with, with audiobooks. Okay. I think it's like a good conversational piece because a lot of people, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people are reading books. And, and the best thing that. I do about that, right, is when they answer you, you say, "What did you take away from that?" Because then you find out if they just made it up or not. Because yeah. sometimes they'll just reel off like a couple of books, and there's been so many occasions where I've been like. like yeah. So what was the, um, what, what was the key takeaway from that? And then they go, they'll say X and I'll be like, great. So then how did you apply that? And then I'll be like, ah, like, <laughs> You're like, yo, Chris, come on, man. Let up off, <laughs> let, let, let up off me, man. But yeah, I think the book, the book thing is like huge. Um, also I, I always ask people how they handle like disagreements. This is the reason be, 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 is because I've worked with certain people who in, in disagreements, they shut down or they just don't know how to handle it. So I, I'm big on like how people handle disagreements in our org. I'm really big on this, like whatever, like Ray Dalio, like the radical candor, like yeah, yeah, of course. Bad, say it's bad. If you don't like it, say you don't like it. If you love it, say you love it, and don't just leave it there. Say why and how you think we can do better or fix it. Um, the worst thing just, you can say is nothing at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we're, we're such a small organization that like we need that constant gut check all the time, or this doesn't work, right? And so we need everyone on the team to be giving feedback all the time, even though it sucks sometimes, but we just need it, so. Yeah, how long has the company been running now? We, we started kind of like tinkering around in 2017. We launched in 2018, like February. So we've been around it's just over three years. Um, we couldn't obviously plan for COVID, but right, as soon as COVID hit, I think in a single day, we grew 410% to the wow. service. Not surprised. Where do you see the biggest room for improvement at the moment then in the business? Yeah, we're, we're obviously scaling, scaling up the team. I think one thing that I'm really looking at is like, again, the credentialing thing makes a ton of sense. Like, how do I get students a, a fine tuned to certain skills that they may need to get a job? But how can I give them those skills earlier in their process? So maybe they are in college, maybe they're not in college, but they still want to do some kind of like online learning. I think that's a really interesting space. I think that's like a ripe space too. So Yeah, I feel like we can talk forever. We got, we got to do a part two and... Um, for everyone listening, this is kind of a bit of an unconventional podcast today. <laughs> We've kind of gone a bit all over the place. But I hope you enjoyed it because uh, when I when I first spoke with Vern, I was super inspired by your journey, Vern. And uh, as a founder of a small team here, kind of just bootstrapped on my side, trying to make our place in this world, it is really refreshing to hear from someone like yourself. And I think what you've built w- will definitely benefit the HR leaders community. So, um you know, where can they learn more about you guys? If, and if they want to reach out to you personally, where's the best place for they to connect with you? Yeah. So ironically, the best place to connect with me is on Twitter. Twitter. LinkedIn. I was not expecting that. LinkedIn's okay, but Twitter is like, I like Twitter a lot. Can you, can, um, you, can you message people on Twitter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can message people, but yeah. I also like the open conversations on Twitter, like the threads. Those are pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So Twitter is cool. LinkedIn for sure. I, I'll add you. I just accept requests at this point. If you want to learn more about Hollow, it's just Hollow there. So H A L L O T H E R E dot com, and you can sign up for free as a company or a student. Um, and, and after after that, we'll kind of reach out to walk you through the platform. So Did I pronounce it wrong there when I said Halo earlier? Yeah, <laughs> it's all good, man. I got it wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all. <good. laughs> It's early, it's early over here, so I probably just didn't catch it. It's so yeah, early. It's you like, didn't catch it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been saying that since we first spoke. So like the whole time. So now everyone listening, you know how the right way to say it, not the way I said it. Um, but look, thanks again, Vern. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, for everyone listening, I'll make sure I link um, all everything that uh, Vern mentioned. I'll link all of those links in the description to make your life easier. Uh, apart from that, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, Vern, enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to following your journey and experience super exciting times. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks, man.